Welcome to the Leader on the Mix show. I'm Audrey Tong. In today's episode, we speak to Dr. Dennis Waitley, best-selling author and motivational speaker. With over 10 million audio programs sold in 14 languages, Dr. Dennis Waitley is one of the most listened to voices on the subject of career and personal success. Join us in this episode of the Leader on the Mix show with Roshan Thiran as we find out more about his life experiences that made him the man he is today. Welcome to the Leadernomic Show. I'm with Dennis Waitley, a legendary author, speaker, and inspirational leader. Dennis, glad to have you here with us. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Th well, tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, you know, you, you've written books. You're, you have a doctorate. Uh, how, how did you get to where you got to? Well, I came from a poor family. Maybe that's t to get out of poverty. Uh, I saw role models that were outside of my family. Mother and father were poor, uh, divorced. He drank too much. I ran to my grandmother's house, mowed her lawn. She gave me encouragement. So my grandmother was the inspiration in my life. But then uh, the war came along with Korea. And so I enlisted and went to the Naval Academy, became a carrier-based Navy jet pilot. So I had a career, nine-year career as a jet pilot. But instead of uh, killing people, I wanted to develop people. So I didn't want a career as military, so I decided to get out and get a doctorate in human behavior. Okay, and, and, and how did that come about, I mean, from uh, being a pilot to a, to a doctor? Well, I was working with the returning prisoners of war, and I noticed that no prisoner escaped from a minimum security camp, but prisoners escaped from a maximum security camp. So I knew that people who were leaders wanted to get home, and people who were not leaders didn't know they could. So, I, But I've always been fascinated with human behavior. I read a lot as a little boy. I uh, wrote a lot. And so I didn't think there was a career in writing or talking. And I went in the military. So it took me quite a while to figure out that I could do something new. Right. And, and how did you end up figuring out that this was your passion? Well, I, start, I, I worked for Dr. Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine and he sent me out to raise money and I found that I could explain complicated scientific terms and easier to understand language. So I found that I was able to persuade audiences to invest in science and I was doing it in the evenings and I started doing it on weekends. So like everybody else I did, like Zig Ziglar and I used to say, we gave 500 talks before anyone would pay us. And then we brought our friends and we had to give them a meal or else they wouldn't just come. To, just to listen to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I gave hundreds and hundreds of talks at night. And finally, uh, so I started my career differently. I started $50, $75, $500, mm -hmm. 1000 And then I started writing. And it wasn't until I wrote The Psychology of Winning, which was yeah. first an audio yeah, program. That's book, right? Yeah. And that happened to hit at a time when America was not doing well. 1978, interest rates were high, the economy was bad, yep. we were mired in all kinds of things. And so the psychology winning hit, and it became the all-time best-selling audio program ever produced by somebody who talks. Wow. Not even close to Miley Cyrus or right. Michael Jackson <laughs> or some of the, some of the singers. But uh, it sold $100 million U.S. for the company that produced it. And yeah. then that, of course, led to the book. And from there on... I oh, so the audio came first and then the book. Huh? The audio came first. And, and uh, Earl Nightingale was the only mm -hmm. one that had an audio album. No one else had one. So, and he was retiring. My timing was perfect. And I had a direct marketing company selling. Wow. So I just was very lucky. Okay. Tell, tell us a bit about, I mean, you always kind of, in your articles that you write, talk about your grandma being a role model, being an inspiration. How, how did she play that role and what did she do specifically that enabled you to, to relook at your mindset and your framework and enable you to get out of that, that? Well, my mother was very bitter and negative because my father left and left with three children. We thought we were a burden mm. on him and her. And so we always felt insecure and not really special. My mother was always negative. In fact, I never heard her say anything positive 
which is maybe why I flipped the switch the other way for self-protection. <laughs> but I rode my bike 20 miles every Saturday to mm. mow my grandmother's lawn. And she said things to me I'd never heard before. You're a good boy. You're going to do well. Uh, let's plant a garden. Whatever we plant will come up. And she talked to me about the seeds of greatness. She said, model yourself after people who've been authentic in their service. Whatever you put in the soil is going to come up. And she mm. said, by the way, weeds don't even need watering. They come in. They just grow. Yeah. They, they fly in and they grow without any cultivation. Yep. So don't concentrate on the weeds, concentrate on the vegetables, the fruit, and the flowers. So she was really the person that I felt gave me a feeling of self-worth. Mm. I mean, there was one other role model that you talked about, your, your eighth grade teacher who gave you this book, The Man Think It, uh, by James Allen, I think, right? Um, how, how did that change your, your was, perspective in life? Was on, I was, you know, 12 years old, and his name was Mr. Seeley, and he, he, uh, he said, I can run faster than any of your fathers who smoke. And he said, uh, people who chew gum are like a cow. Because, and so he said all these things. And then he said, you know, you have some potential for writing and things. And so I'm going to give you this book. And as a man thinketh was about gardening, the garden of okay. your mind. Going back to your seed and all that. Yeah, and yep. so it, it clicked with me at the age of 12. I used to go to watch speakers speak back in those days. and. Now, finally, they became my friends, like Norman Vincent Peale and yep, Schuller. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, and, and um, I mean, how, you know, these things affected you to some extent, but to have that flip from, you know, poverty to, to having a certain mindset to really, you know, be the person you are, and then now inspiring others to do likewise. Were, were there other incidences that, that triggered these, uh, this, this mindset change? I think so, especially <clears throat> when you look at the psychology of winning, you would think that an author would write about his great success. So you would go to a program and, and because he was successful and put it in his book, you would buy it to learn from him. Just the opposite for me. I wrote this book and that album at the worst point in my life. I wrote it when I was divorced, had custody of four children and no income. So I had four little children who I had custody of, was not married, was not employed. So I wrote this for me. What am I not doing? Why am I losing? What am I forgetting? So it's to a very, do? very, in a very reflective tone, somewhat. Yes, and sure, I'd been a Navy pilot. You know, I'd, I'd had some goal setting, some discipline, and went to the Naval Academy, but I was not successful. I only had temporary success. Now, certainly not a successful husband. I'm divorced. Maybe not a successful father. My children wanted to go home. And they said, you can't cook. You don't brush our hair very well. <laughs> we wish you were a woman. So I took a look at myself in the mirror. And I said, how would I like a mentor, role model, father like me? And I knew I had to change. So I, the research was all for me. So losers can write winning things because at the worst time in your life is when you should dig deep for the best. So the best should come out when you're having problems because when things are going well, you coast. Yeah, that's true. Okay, we're going to take a quick break right now and we'll be back with more secrets from Dennis Waitley. We're back with Dennis Waitley here on the Leadernomics Show. Dennis, you know, you were just talking about how you wrote this book in your gloomiest, uh, uh, probably the worst time of your life. Um, how, how did you manage to remain optimistic and pull yourself out of this, this situation and enable yourself to, to even write this book and to be able to uh, um, be able to take yourself out of that situation? Well, my mother said that even though she was negative, that I was always happy. And maybe that made her mad that I was always happy and that she was always unhappy. Because she would say, it must be nice for you to go play with your friends while I have to cook your dinner. Right. I, said, well, well, I, I think all mothers say that. You know, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to go, mother. But uh, I think that, um, you know, I've been watching, reading, listening to, I've been reading biographies all my life mm. of people who've overcome enormous obstacles to become successful. Yep. And I've saved a lot of time by reading their story and then by believing that maybe I could do something maybe not as good as they, but maybe I could do better mm. because they did. And if they did it, why not me? 
So I think reading biographies and living in my imagination help. Yeah, do, do you think that, I mean, a lot of people advocate reading, but I, you know, one thing, the point that you made, that when I read, I, I gain somebody else's experience, and I'm able to put that as part of mine, and so I, I have you know, much bigger context you know, in regards to making better decisions and so on. Do you, you think that's true? Absolutely. In fact, the people that read the most are the most successful regardless of their occupation. So even a farmer who reads, mm. because reading stimulates your imagination, takes you where they've gone, you go there in your mind, and so you read fiction and nonfiction. Fiction gives you an imagination, nonfiction gives you history. Right. So why, why have to repeat the mistakes of others when you can learn from others' mistakes? Absolutely. And I've been reading some of your stuff, and, and you recently wrote on Leoramix.com, uh, our site, that failure is the fertilizer of success. Um, what do you mean? You know, well, just, that's, one just of my some favorite, that's one of my favorite <laughs> expressions because nobody likes it, doesn't smell good, and you don't want to roll in it because fertilizer is just has an awful smell mm -hmm. to it. However, when you mulch it and put it on new crops, it helps them grow. So failure is a learning experience, a temporary inconvenience. Right, which a, we all hate, right? A detour. Yeah. Yep. But failure is consistent with people who win because there never was a winner who didn't lose mm. along the way. Yeah, and I guess you also made a point some time ago about the fact that when we look at great leaders who succeeded, it's usually at the tail end of their, their, their sort of journey and, and there's a lot of failures that we don't sometimes talk about. Um, that, that come along. Do, do, you, do you agree that's uh, something that we, we need to talk a little bit more about on, on the failure pieces that all of us, and, and enable us to motivate ourselves to, to, to be able to face the challenges that come across? No, that's not only a great question, that's a great statement. Because if you look in the Library of Congress, if you look at all the books that have been written, there's only been a few on failure. Hmm. Everyone wants to know about success, but if you study failure, then you know why they failed, what they needed to learn and change. So I think failure is something we should study more and not yeah. be afraid of it. I guess the problem in failure is that when you're successful, you can talk about your failures. But when you're not, you know, it's hard to talk about your failures, right? And that's why resumes, we have resumes of success, but hardly any resumes of failures. Huh? But everyone talks about stumbling blocks become stepping stones right. and going up, around, and over. That's true, that's and, true. And failure is a given. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather... Even Michael Jordan, we were talking to him, he said, you know, I've missed half my shots. Yeah, absolutely. You know. and, and you know, a lot of people, they, they've accumulated success, and then they come to the point in life where they said, I want to be significant. I know you've talked a lot about legacy, and, uh, and, 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 and that legacy is not really about the future, but it's about the now. But tell us a little bit about that and, and your perspective of success and significance. Well, I think success is not a place that you arrive at, so you're always under construction. I think it's a process, not a status. And I think to say that I'm a success is arrogant mm. because something will happen next week. The doctor will tell you something. Something will happen in the That's family. True. So success is a journey. And you should never fall in love with it. Mm. You should enjoy it while you have it. You know, it's like uh, Andy Warhol said, enjoy your 14 minutes of, of, <laughs> fame. of fame because fame is so fleeting, so unimportant. And, and there's a problem with young people. Maybe it's because I'm older, and older people always criticize younger generation. But everyone's into selfies. You know, I was there. Yep. Look at me. I'm there in history. Yep. And we go inward rather than taking our value outward. So there's a little bit too much emphasis yeah. on me, how I look, what I drive, what I wear, what I own, what I have. And, and it, to me, it's uh, skin deep. But how do you change that? I mean, it seems to be permeating all across the world that... The, 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 you know, the being inward looking rather than, than outward looking. How, how, how would you change that though? Well, I think being older, I'm in a position to do that because as you get closer to the end, the tape goes faster. Mm -hmm. And so the, the older you are, the faster time goes. And I would be able to tell people that uh, quality of life is not money. Quality of life is where you are, what kind of environment, who you're with, and what you're giving back after you've gained all this significance in life. Right, right. In fact, you should gain significance by your own insignificance. Yeah, that's true. You know, I feel like I'm just an oboe player in the 28th row of the, you know, I'm not the maestro, 
I'm in the 16th row playing the, the oboe that nobody sees. So yeah. I don't think we should fall uh, in love you, with it. You probably are the violinist, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we can debate that. You know. yeah. we're, we're going to take another quick break, uh, and we'll be right back with our third and final segment of the Leader on Make Show here with Dennis Wheatley. Thank you. Welcome back to the Leadernomics Show. I'm here with Dennis Waitley in our final segment of this show. Dennis, we were talking a lot about the different nuggets of wisdoms that you have been imparting to us. I, you know, I'm amazed at how energized and motivated and, uh, and driven you are. Um, well, but, but tell I'm us a bit I, about how you do that. What's your secret? But, I, but I'm only 83. Ah, you know. And so I haven't decided what I'm going to do for probably a career yet. Forty odd years to go. Right? So I worry more <laughs> about my complexion than my heart. <laughs> but what keeps you? What, what drives you? What, what motivates you? I think planting shade trees for the future generation, keeping around young people. And whenever I get down, I either go to a children's ward in a leukemia hospital and see children overcoming things, or I go to an Alzheimer's ward and see old people like me who can't remember the things that I remember. So what keeps me going is to stay involved, stay engaged, and keep planting, keep giving value, yeah. giving more value. You know, you know, just now you were mentioning earlier privately about your, how close you are to your family and how you're, in, you're, you're kind of uh, spending their inheritance. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I've always said what you leave in your children is more important than what you leave to them in the estate. Yeah, I agree. And there are so many people who build up this huge estate and then give it to their children. And what they say is, I don't want my children to have to do what I had to do, which is you're giving them entitlement yeah. but no empowerment. So it's really not a good idea to pass on money Best, better to pass on maybe a foundation that they've learned how to run and, and let them travel and help people. So I'm giving any residual money to orphans. And my children said, but we feel like orphans. I said, no, come on, we've been traveling all over the world. So, and, and you travel with them all the time? Just yeah, I, so I they took, yeah, I took them. I, I chartered a yacht in Alaska and they said, wow, boy, are you generous? And I said, no, that, that's, that's $50,000 less than you all are going to inherit. And they said, what? And I said, sure, I'm taking you everywhere I've wanted to go with you and enjoying my life with you rather than to give you a Ferrari yeah. that I won't get to ride in with yeah, you later. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, on, on the flip side, I mean, one is uh, you know, to, to, to have this uh, public image and so on. How, how do you keep yourself grounded? Um, how do you keep yourself humble? How do you keep yourself uh, you know, continually um, human you know, to some extent? Well, I think one of the most important things that I've learned is I'm as good as the best, but no better than the rest. Mm. So I treat everyone equal, no matter who they are. Taxi driver, transportation executive, waitress, food service executive. Everyone's as good as me. I'm as good as them. I'm no better than them, and yet they're, they're no better than I. Right. So I think keeping grounded means don't get impressed. Uh, people who try to be impressive are the least impressive. Mm. People that shout the loudest are calling for help. Mm. People that try to make a big statement are often hiding a lightly valued self. If you need to stretch limousine, you need to stretch limousine yeah. to stretch your value. So some people get so impressed with the material side of themselves, they actually feel superior. Mm. And they're going to get old too. Yeah, yeah, and, and things kind of fade away. Yeah, instead of becoming a leading man or leading woman, they become a character actor. Yeah, yeah. And it's really hard for some people to age gracefully yeah. because they were in such demand when they were younger and that now they're just furniture. Yeah, no, that's true. You know, tell us a bit about your book, uh, The Psychology of Winning. And, you know, if you can share one or two nuggets of wisdom that, that people can take out of this book. Well, I think the important thing is that life is a perception through the eye of the beholder doesn't make any difference what's happened to you, it's how you take it and what you make of it. And that having the belief in your potential is more important than waiting for your performance. I travel all throughout China. I've been in 50 Chinese cities last year and they believe you don't have worth till you perform. Mm. I believe you need to have worth so you can perform up to your potential. And you must believe in your dream when that's all you have to hang on to. And that really is the basis for the psychology and when okay. accept that there's a lot of self-discipline and habit involved. In fact, I'm what you would call a habit master. I know that habits are 90% of what we do yep. and they're like submarines. They're silent and deep and you don't break them. You have to, you really have to change them. You can't break mm -hmm. a habit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. And, and you know, a little bit kind of whispered to me that you have a new sequel that's coming out. Uh, it's to this yeah, it's called the Neuropsychology of Winning. Okay. And I've been researching for the past five years the new breakthroughs in neuroscience. 
For example, you can rewire your brain, mm -hmm. create a new neural pathway, create a new habit that wasn't there before. It'll jump over the old habit, and you can actually even get new talent. You can uh, have better habits, and by rewiring the circuits in your brain, and there's a certain way to do it, so that's what my new program okay. is all about. How do you rewire okay. so you can refire? And, and I know the good news is that anyone can rewire their brain regardless of age, right? They can. Oh, well, that's the best news <laughs> of all because, you know, I found my car keys in the refrigerator the other day and okay. I wondered how they got there. Uh, well, but I, now I can rewire. Happens to me too, so. <laughs> I can get new neurons now. And that's really exciting. Uh, there'll be a wearable device that you have called a brain-computer interface. Okay. And you'll be able to think your garage door open You'll be able yeah, to, th right. yeah, you'll be yeah, able to yeah. think your light's on. If you're going to have a stroke, you'll know you're going to have it, and you'll be able to call 911 or a paramedic right. before it happens. So these things, and virtual reality is not just for video games. Right. It's to overcome phobias, fear of needles, fear of heights, fear of speaking in public. They're all new, hmm. all new uh, virtual reality. Okay. Unbelievable, the use of the brain and, and mind for these new healthy things. Yeah, yeah. And so your book is going to cover pertinent pieces of information of, and, of that, and new and, research. And, that and how to rewire and how to, how to make it a habit, how to make it reflexive. That's what Olympians do, yep. just that they have to do it for 1,200 days. And maybe it only will take 300 days. Okay. So we do it for a year and we should get it. That's right. If you do it for a year, if you do it right in drill, you'll do it right in life. Okay. Because the mind can't distinguish between vivid simulation and reality, it stores the same. And that's coming in on August, right? Yes. Okay, so we look forward to that book. Thank you very now, much. Now, my final two questions is, you know, if I was a young graduate or just graduated from university, I come out and say, I want to be Dennis Waitley. I, you know, I want to be you know, successful. I want to be a speaker. I want to I be, you know, like him uh, and emulate him. What kind of advice would you give such a person? Well, the first advice I'd say is, uh, where are you speaking now? I've had many people come to me and say they want to be a rock star, they want to be this, and I always say, where are you singing now? Mm -hmm. Where are you playing now? And they said, well, I'm very busy, I have the study, I have a new baby. They have, give me all the reasons why right. they're putting they're it off. It. And you need to be doing what you want to do, even though you're doing it in front of some friends. Mm -hmm. So you need to constantly be in it and rehearse, because dress rehearsal is the same thing as the, the live event. The other thing it would be is uh, believe in, in yourself because you're as good as anyone who's ever come along. So you, and don't be hypnotized by good looking and, and what, what people class as the right look. Yep. The most successful people in the world look pretty average. I mean, you look <laughs> at Bill Gates, he looks like an older Harry yeah. Potter. Yeah. You know, That's I true. mean, uh, he, people, probably look he probably looks better now, though. So. <laughs> yeah, he looks better now than when he did. But, but the best advice I'd give them is to. Uh, Study, study leaders, mentors, role models, but make sure they haven't just written a book. Make sure they've lived the book. Make yeah. sure they've really done what they say, that they're not just good speakers, yeah. not just good writers, but they've actually are authentic. Yeah. And that way you can emulate and learn from them and modeling saves time. Okay. Now my final question, you know, if you were to address a group of CEOs, or company leaders, um, what sort of nugget of wisdom would you impart to these people? I think the most important thing is that uh, they need to get rid of boss language. They need to stop getting compliance. They need to get innovation. And what they need to do is bring the best out of the people already on the payroll. So human capital has taken over from natural resource. So they really need to treat their people like winners and champions and mm -hmm. stop complaining, stop bossing, and start bringing out the best. They really need to change the communication so they have dialogue instead of meetings where they give orders, best thing to do is they come in and they ask questions. Make sure that you bring out of your people everything that's in their mind. Mm. There's a lot of great ideas on the payroll. Wow, that's great. Dennis, thank you so much for being here thank you. on The Your May Show. We've been speaking to Dennis Waitley, author, speaker, and inspirational leader here on The Leadernomic Show.